Some of you are familiar perhaps with the name Mickey Cohen. You're old enough to remember him as one of the most flamboyant criminals of the 1950s. And perhaps you also remember there was a period of time when there was a big to-do over the fact that Mickey had become a Christian, quote unquote. He had been invited to a crusade meeting by Billy Graham. He had been touched by the message. He seemed open to it, and somebody else decided this would be a great opportunity to show what Christ could do. Sat down with him, um, read to him Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And Mickey said, yes, I can do that. Only problem was that Mickey's life didn't seem to change. And several people sat down with him and said, you know, this means that you're going to have to give up your profession and your friends. And he said, well, I don't quite understand. After all, there are Christian football players and Christian cowboys and Christian politicians. Why not a Christian gangster? <laughs> Obviously, Mickey did not experience the newness of life that really should come in Christ. And that is one of the problems we see in the church today. A lot of people are making a profession of faith, saying, yes, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, and yet you sure can't tell it by the way they live their lives. There are no real changes. This first beatitude, talking about blessed are those who are poor in spirit, is one of the things we have to take a look at. It's the foundation still. Each of the eight Beatitudes open with the word blessed or blessed. And it's essential to understand that this, what this word means, for it bears on everything that we will be saying the remainder of our study over the next week <coughs> ahead. Contrary to popular opinion, blessed does not mean happy. I wish that the uh, living translation of the Bible did not translate these words that way. It means not happy because happy is sort of a, a feeling, a, subject, uh, a rather subjective kind of thing. Rather, <clears throat> it means approved. God comes to us and says, I approve of you, <coughs> not because what you have done, but because you come to me with poverty of spirit. Now, one of the things we're going to have to take a look at is saying, do we really want to be approved by God? Do we want our lives to be lived in a way that brings the words of God, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because of what's in us, but simply because of what God has done through us. Do we desire God's approval more than anything else? What does poor in spirit mean? Let me answer by first stating what it does not mean. Poverty of spirit is not the conviction that one is of no value whatsoever. That doesn't mean it at all. After all, Christ died for each and every one of us. So our lives are worth the death of our Savior. We mean that much to God. Nor does poor in spirit mean lacking in vitality. Nor does Poor in spirit means shyness, because I've known a lot of introverted people who are incredibly proud and stiff-necked. It does not refer to a showy humility like Uriah Heep in Charles Dickens' David Copperfield novel, who keeps on telling everybody over and over again, I'm just a humble person. Very often we discover that those people who seem to tell us how humble they are, are incredibly prideful. They want you to say, oh no, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. Well, 
What then does poor in spirit mean? The history of the Greek word used here provides some insight. It comes from a verbal root which denotes a cowering and a cringing like a beggar. In fact, in the New Testament, where it is usually used, it is used for someone who is begging on the street, someone who recognizes because of their poverty or because of their frailty or paralysis or blindness, they are totally at the mercy of the help of others. So in a sense, what this means is they're blessed those who realize that they have nothing within themselves to commend them to God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's not the way our society wants to look at things. They would say, blessed is the person who is always right, who is strong, who rules, who is satisfied with himself, who is rich and popular. But that's not the way it is. In fact, someone has jokingly said, someone's probably going to make a statue of the 21st century man in such a position that he's got his arms wrapped around himself looking in a mirror at his reflection. It's like, aren't I important? And God is telling us, I can't use you if you think you're important. The only people I can really use are those who recognize that they have nothing to offer. They can't win their own salvation. They need me. And that's the real interesting thing here. Because when we recognize our need of God, he is willing to feed us and fill us with his word, his power, his grace. It's not who we are. It is what God can do through each and every one of us. <coughs> I often will hear someone say, I'm just one person. Or I'm a person who hasn't had that good an education. Or they, they make all kinds of excuses why God can't use them. And what God is really saying to us is, I can use anybody who will open themselves up to me. I may not use them in huge ways, but they may be ways that impact the lives of individuals. A pastor who never served a very large church at all was recognized at the end of his ministry for having had 25, 26 young people from his congregations he had served who had become pastors, Christian educators, missionaries. He may not have been an influential pastor in terms of size of congregation, but he did something that touched the lives of young people for the service of God. He spent time with them. Was he a great preacher? No. Was he a great Bible teacher? It was okay, but nothing great. But there was something in his spirit that allowed God to flow into the lives of other people. He was able to cash a vision to these young people that God might very well want them and could use them. Poverty of spirit is essential for blessing. We must understand and embrace true poverty, poverty of spirit. For we see that very often... Those who God uses are raised up from nothing. King David did not come from a leading family. And he was the youngest. He was the runt. His father, when Samuel came uh, to spend time with his family, didn't even think about bringing David in from the fields. He was watching the sheep. He was just the runt of the litter. And throughout his life, David would say things like, Who am I, and what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, 
that I should be first king, son-in-law of the king, and then king. Throughout his life, as long as he remembered that he was a vessel to be filled by God, things went well. When he got too big for his own britches, that's when things fell apart. Poverty of spirit is indispensable for salvation because it is a sign of being open to God's grace. The sad part is that there are many people in churches who have not understood this. They're counting on getting to heaven because of what they have done. Many years ago, evangelism explosion material would ask the question to people, if you died tonight and you were at heaven's gate, what would you say as to why they should let you in? And most people would try and talk about the good things they'd done in life, trying to live a good life. And the answer is, Jesus Christ died for me. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That is why heaven's gates should open. The fact is, many of us don't know how to be broken enough to be usable for God. And many of those who lead the church astray are people who are well-meaning, but they are so worked up on using their gifts to impress other people that they really are not usable for God. Years ago, as I was serving in Dearborn, Michigan, the pastor of a Baptist church, um, who I knew very well, was asked by someone, isn't such and such a person a member of your congregation? A woman with a beautiful voice. And he said, it must be such a blessing to have her as a part of your congregation. She's a well-known singer. And his answer was, I wouldn't know. We never see her. We never hear her. She was so wrapped up in letting people know what a great voice she had that she really was not serving God. Poverty of spirit is essential for spiritual growth. Contrary to the thinking of some, we never outgrow that first beatitude even though it is the basis for all those that come after it. In fact, if we outgrow it, we have outgrown our Christianity. We've lost our faith. And that's what our reading from the third chapter of Revelation is really about. The church in Laodicea had gotten so big for its britches that God would say to it, you've lost your way. You're not following me. You're not usable. You're naked, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor. The only thing that can reclaim you is to allow me to wash you, to refine you, to clothe you, to fill your eyes with a special salve that will allow you to see what I'm doing around you. I mentioned, I've mentioned repeatedly, the one of the problems we have in our society is that people don't listen to each other. Have you ever noticed that people often respond to what someone else is saying before that person even finishes? They have been working on their rejoinder, their rebuttal to what the person is saying without even having listened all the way through to hear what the person is saying. They're so full of themselves that they can't listen to anybody else. And every one of us can think in our own society, in our own little circle of friends, that there are people who are like that. Sometimes by God's grace, by listening, we hear something that we would have missed, and it's an important something. A person who does pastoral counseling often will discover that it is the little things that are said that suddenly open up windows of opportunity. 
listening well enough to understand what the real need is. And every pastor will tell you that very often they have discovered on a visit or as someone come into their office, it is until the very last minute that people actually blurt out while they're, why they are there. And they try and make sure that they build in time and anything to make sure that that person has an opportunity to speak the reason why they're really there. If we rush through things in life, if we're trying to get through things, if we use people as just something to move past, God's not working in us. We're not really a blessing. And the reward for poverty of spirit really is amazing here. First of all, it's a reward both now and in the future. Those who have life in Christ sometimes live amazing lives, even if they aren't rich, even if they aren't powerful. God uses them. They are the ones who seem to always be there when someone else needs it. They have an instinctive spirit that allows them to see need and to give themselves to it. Jesus told a story in Luke 18 about a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee spent his time praying to God to tell God how great he was. And the tax collector shared from his heart how broken his life was. And Jesus would say, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. We must realize that the initial tie between our souls and Christ is not goodness, but our badness. Not our merit, but our misery. God takes us in our brokenness, and he recreates us. But we have to let him do it. And so often we're not good at letting God into our lives. This is we're not good at letting other people into our lives. Listen to Jesus' words. Blessed, approved by God, are the beggarly in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. The question I must ask is, have you experienced the true poverty of spirit to allow God to fill you? Can you say in the words of the hymn, Rock of Ages, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Do you truly know Jesus? Or are you one of those church attenders who've been here but God's never been able to do anything with him. The other great lesson for all of us, regardless of spiritual maturity, is that poverty of spirit is necessary for continual spiritual blessing. God has asked us to be lifelong learners. If you've ever thought you've arrived, if you know everything, boy, that's the time when you're heading for a fall. Whenever you say to God, okay, God, I can take it from here, you're going to smack into a wall. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they know they need God. Blessed are those who realize that what they've got in the way of talent and ability is really small. But God takes small things and does amazing things. In my 40 years of ministry, I have been amazed by who God uses in ministry and who he doesn't. God doesn't always use the best and brightest, not because he doesn't want to, but because they don't let him. And it's often that humble servant who does a background job that seems to have an impact on the life of the church. 
It's often our times of failure, our times of brokenness, our times of defeat, that God picks us up by the hands and say, okay, you're exactly where I need you to be. Now I can fill you. Now I can use you. Jesus said, blessed are those who know how broken they are. For then God can fill them and use them.